Hello everyone, welcome to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. This is the uh, series on chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Okay, in the next uh, few sessions, let's discuss various chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, starting with emphysema in today's session. So basically, in this session, let's understand the differences between obstructive versus uh, restrictive lung diseases. General concepts about chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Understand in detail about the uh, emphysema, particularly the classification, pathogenesis, clinical features, morphology, and a bit about diagnosis and treatment of emphysema. So, lung diseases, you know, based on the pulmonary function test, they are broadly categorized into obstructive and restrictive lung diseases, right? So, what is this obstructive lung disease? Basically, there is increase in the resistance to the airflow that is due to either partial or complete obstruction at any level in the respiratory tract. Whereas, restrictive lung diseases basically means there is reduced expansion of lung parenchyma with decreased total lung capacity. Now, as I told you, this classification is based on pulmonary function test. So, what happens in obstructive lung disease? The ratio of forced expiratory volume at first second to forced vital capacity is less than 0 0.7. Whereas in restricted lung diseases, you know, there is proportionate decrease in both total lung capacity as well as forced expiratory volume at first second. That's the reason why FEV1 by FVC ratio is normal in case of restricted lung disease. So, what are the examples of obstructive diseases? It's emphysema, chronic bronchitis bronchial asthma and bronchiectasis whereas restrictive lung diseases include various chest wall disorders could be either acute or chronic interstitial and infiltrative lung diseases right so let's move on to understand the concepts behind chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as per the world health organization the definition of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is it's a common preventable and Treatable disease, which is characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow limitation, which is due to airway and or alveolar abnormalities, which is caused by exposure to various noxious particles or gases. So, this is a definition given by World Health Organization. We need to know that this is the fourth leading cause of death in the world and there is a strong association between heavy cigarette smoking and COPD. So much so that 35 to 50 percent of heavy smokers develop chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. So, the, there are other risk factors as well. What are those? It could be poor lung development early in life. It could be because of exposure to environmental and occupational pollutants. It could be because of airway hyperresponsiveness or because of certain genetic polymorphisms. Right? That's general concepts about chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Now, let's look into emphysema in detail now. Now, what is emphysema? By definition, emphysema means it's irreversible enlargement. That's dilatation of air spaces. Remember, distal to the terminal bronchiole. Okay. And that is almost always accompanied by destruction of the walls of the respiratory tree, distal to terminal bronchiole. So, remember, dilatation, distal and destruction. Remember, three Ds of emphysema, which is distal dilatation associated with destruction. Right. Now, functionally important small airway fibrosis can be present, but that is very subtle in emphysema. Now, how do you classify emphysema? Classification of emphysema, to, to understand the classification of emphysema, you need to understand the uh, anatomic distribution of respiratory tree within the lobule. Right. So, there is a terminal bronchiole which gives rise to respiratory bronchiole and then leads on to form alveolar duct and finally the alveoli. Okay, so this whole process distal to the terminal bronchiole is known as a sinus and that's a septum. If you understand this anatomic distribution, it's very easy to understand the classification of emphysema into centriacinar type of emphysema. What is the centriacinar type of emphysema? It is this proximal part of this respiratory tree distal to this terminal bronchiole is dilated. Okay, so the respiratory bronchiole this part is dilated. This is centriacinar, whereas the distal part is spare. 
So the next one is pan assigner emphysema where the entire assigners, okay. So look at this, the whole thing is diluted. This is pan assigner. The third category is paraseptal. The distalmost part of the respiratory tree is the one which is dilated and that's very next to the septum. That's why it's called paraseptal emphysema. And the last one is called irregular emphysema. It's neither central nor panacinar or paraseptal. It could be haphazardly distributed. That's irregular type of emphysema. Okay. So, these are the four different categories of emphysema. They are centriacinar, panacinar, paraseptal and irregular emphysema. So, of these four, only these two, that is centriacinar and panacinar emphysema, they are the ones which cause clinically significant airflow obstruction. Now let's look into each of these emphysemas in detail. Centriacinar emphysema, this is the most common form of emphysema which occurs predominantly in heavy smokers with chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. So what is that you see here? Here you see both emphysematous, that is dilated part, both emphysematous as well as the normal air spaces coexist within the same assignus, right? Within the same assignus and lobule you have the emphysematous area as well as the normal area. So, it's more commonly and more pronounced in the upper lobes of the lung, particularly in the apical segments. Remember, centriacinar emphysema, upper lobes of the lung, particularly apical segments. Now, moving on to the panacinar emphysema, this is the type of emphysema which is associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. We will look into this in detail a bit later. As of now, remember, it's associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and that and exacerbated by smoking. And these are the type of emphysema which tends to occur more commonly in the lower zones than the upper one, you know, usually in the lower zones and in the anterior margins of the lung. And they are most severe at the base of the lungs, right? So that's about panacinar. Moving on to the paraseptal type of emphysema, which is more striking adjacent to the pleura or the septa, which is what we were told, right? It is found along the lobular connective tissue septa and in the margins of the lobule. So that's why it's called paraseptal. It usually occurs adjacent to the areas of fibrosis, scarring, or even atelectasis. And remember, these are the kind of emphysema, type of emphysema which is more severe in the upper half of the lungs. Moving on to the irregular uh, type of emphysema, which is also referred to as air space enlargement with fibrosis. It's almost invariably associated with scarring of lung parenchyma, which is very small, occurs in a very small foci and clinically insignificant, insignificant. Okay, these kind of these are the type of emphysema which is clinically insignificant. Now, having understood the different types of emphysema, let's look into the pathogenesis of emphysema. Right. So, to understand the pathogenesis, let us understand these normal concepts. The first one is elastin. What is elastin? Elastin is an important component of the extracellular matrix. Okay, in the lung parenchyma as well as in the distal air uh, spaces, they, I mean, this elastin is required to maintain the integrity of lung parenchyma and the small airways. Now, remember, this elastin is destroyed by elastasis. And where do these elastases come from? They are released by the neutrophils. Okay, during the process of inflammation, where neutrophils are more, they release these proteases or elastases, which can digest this elastin. Okay, once the elastin is digested, what is what happens? They can destroy the parenchyma and small air spaces. This is the basic mechanism of emphysema. So, we have seen that neutrophils releases proteases and thereby destroying elastin and digestion of lung parenchyma. There has to be some check mechanism for these things. There has to be some mechanism where this process is controlled. How is that possible? That's possible because of the presence of alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is normally found in serum, tissue fluids and macrophages. Okay, what do these? Uh, uh, what does this do? This alpha one antitrypsin inhibits this elastase, inhibits this protease. Once there is inhibition of elastases, there is no digestion of elastin, so that results in halting or control of the proteases released by the neutrophils during inflammation, and this is called as protease anti-protease activity. Now consider a scenario where there is alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. 
if the alpha 1 antitrypsin is not there what happens so there is uninhibited activity of proteases so activity of elastin degradation is more thereby leading to digestion of elastic tissue in the lung parenchyma got it so if there is alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency there will be no check or control mechanisms for protease activity in the lung parenchyma during the process of inflammation now let's come back to understand the major pathogenesis remember the most important predisposing factors are the smoking atmospheric pollution with genetic predisposition what does these do this basically the smoking and this pollution damages the respiratory epithelium thereby the damaged epithelial cells and the histiocytes or the macrophages releases the mediators what are these mediators they are leukotriene b4 interleukin 8 and tumor necrosis factor which act as chemotactic factor okay they can amplify inflammation also they can induce structural changes by release of various growth factors all these things can lead to destruction of alveolar wall which is wall, what we call as emphysema so this is one part of pathogenetic mechanism so all these things remember the smoking the damaged cells the mediators everything you know that increases the level of oxidants in the lung parenchyma which can further cause tissue damage endothelial dysfunction and inflammation which further exacerbate the destruction of wall thereby leading to emphysema okay so remember smoking also increases the activity of neutrophils we saw earlier that neutrophils are the ones which releases what proteases particularly elastases which leads to destruction of alveolar wall so the patient is smoking upon that if the person is having congenital alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency right what happens that leads to imbalance of this protease normal protease antiprotease mechanism imbalance thereby leading to uninhibited activity of these proteases leading to destruction of alveolar wall okay so this is in just about the pathogenesis of emphysema now we know that there is destruction of alveolar wall and the airways are dilated but then why obstruction why is that this is this this is called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease okay for that remember elastic tissue whatever is there in the lung parenchyma is the one which helps in recoil of lung parenchyma and thus maintains the patency of small airways this small airways of small airways are held open by this recoil mechanism if the elastic tissue is damaged this whole recoil mechanism is lost okay so we know that airways are dilated that's because of destruction of airways destruction of what destruction of elastic tissue in the walls of the alveoli which surround the respiratory bronchioles so once that happens you know that reduces the radial traction leading to collapse of respiratory bronchioles during expiration which is why it is known as functional airflow obstruction though there is no mechanical obstruction because of collapse of respiratory bronchioles there is functional airflow obstruction and that's why this is still categorized as obstructive pulmonary disease now what are the clinical features very non-specific features they can present with shortness of breath and cough with or without sputum production some patients you know they might present with wheezing because of functional airflow obstruction the early stages of emphysema patients tend to lose weight and that's because of systemic inflammation okay and also because of the increased energy spent in the work of breathing so what kind of breathing these kind these patients have they breathe through pursed lips so why do they do so that's because by doing so it increases airway pressure and that prevents airway collapse during respiration we know that there is already damaged respiratory uh, tree distal respiratory tree right because of loss of elastic tissue by breathing through pursed lips the air pressure in the airway is increased thereby it prevents collapse that's why patient you know they spend more energy in the work of breathing and they are typically non-cyanotic as compared to that of chronic bronchitis which we'll be dealing later and that is the reason why these patients are referred to as pink puffers pink puffers because they breathe 
through pursed lips and they are non cyanotic in the late stages because of continuous inflammation they lose more and more weight and they look cachectic if there is a coexisting infection all these symptoms exacerbate so that's how these patients manifest what is the morphology of emphysema it's see emphysema by definition is a pathological diagnosis grossly the lungs are voluminous which often overlap the heart anteriorly so this is a very beautiful illustration of lung parang lung uh, emphysematous lung from this source so where you can see that the alveoli are very large and dilated which can be seen on the cut surface of the fixed lung pical blubs can also be seen or the emphysematous bulla can also be seen but that's characteristic of irregular emphysema more so in advanced cases of emphysema okay so microscopically all you find is abnormally large air spaces abnormally large alveoli thinning of the alveolar septa all that you can see sometimes you can see the septa septa is thin but then there will be focal centra acinar fibrosis okay you identify large dilated air spaces that is when you are sure that you are dealing with a case of emphysema so how do you diagnose emphysema though it is a pathological diagnosis patients based on the symptoms they are subjected to pulmonary function testing particularly spirometry normally you know these copds respond to bronchodilative therapies so even after bronchodilative therapy if the fev1 by fvc ratio is less than 0.07 that is diagnostic of emphysema chest x ray is not routinely ordered only if severe you can uh, you know get the chest x ray done where you can see hyperinflation of lungs and there will be flattening of diaphragm if the patient is young and you can and you diagnose this is a, this is emphysema remember you have to rule out what congenital alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency so test for alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency in case the patient is very young how do you treat these cases there is no definitive treatment for emphysema all that is done is medical and supportive therapy in the initial stages emphysema if you know if the patients are lucky they respond well to these bronchodilators with or without corticosteroids but in the later stages all you need is supportive therapy by oxygen therapy or could be pulmonary ventilation support ventilator support or could be pulmonary rehabilit rehabilitation or even palliative care so this is all about emphysema so in this session we discuss in detail about the emphysema the classification pathogenesis clinical features morphology diagnosis and treatment thank you for watching if you have liked this video hit the like button do comment if you have any queries to ask don't forget to subscribe if you are new to this channel and please do share if you find this video useful thank you Stay tuned for the next part of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease where I'll be dealing with chronic bronchitis. Bye-bye.